How you doing? Very good. All right, so quick update as this, the projector turns on. So the way we're gonna kind of do things, my understanding of the university's policy on stuff, I received so many emails, is that we are going to, uh, as long as we don't have positive cases, uh, directly in this class, then we stay in person, like as normal, like have to do everything in person, all that jazz, right? Um, we do have a positive case, then mask has to be mandatory. Mandatory, I know OSU's stance is, I think, expected, um, but then we can continue in person, but they have to be mandatory. But what I'm also going to do is, what I started doing is bringing my mic to class, and I record the lecture as I go, and I have a little YouTube channel that's just called Professor Smart, and anytime I've ever had to record anything, I throw it up on there, because I find it much easier for students to access YouTube than anything else. Um, so I'll share that link with everybody. And so I'll just record lectures from here on out. So God forbid someone has a COVID case or exposure or something, you can't come, then at least it's recorded. Also in the future, if I ever teach this class online, I'll already have it all recorded. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm recording for your other classes too? Uh, for my on that um, YouTube channel I have uh, for my fundamentals and management classes, I'll record it as well. So yeah, you'll, there'll be marked though for each class. I do delete them at the end of every semester when I use it because I don't know what OSU's policy is, but some universities have a problem with you putting like uh, our material and stuff up on the line for everybody to see. Um, so I usually leave it on there. Nobody ever views it except for people in this class. And then I delete it at the end of the semester. And all my stuff usually has my name on it and everything anyway, so I'm not worried about stuff, people stealing my stuff. But they do, great, spread the knowledge. A lot smarter people you could steal from, so joke's on you. <laughs> So today, um, I feel like this lecture. Also, I'm going to wear a jacket the entire time I teach because I swear that's the air conditioner, not the heater. I have reason. Uh, today, we are going to um, talk a little bit more about case analysis. We're going to talk a lot about organizational performance. Uh, we've been doing fun things talking like mission, vision, or mission statements, value statements, vision statements, or vision statements. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about evaluating financial performance, organizational performance, and balance sheets, or balance scorecards. And just the structure of this is I'm going to lecture for about 45 minutes to an hour. We're going to take a little break. Then we're going to come back, and you all will go into groups, and you'll spend about 30 minutes working on a mini case that I have. I put a lot of the files on Canvas that you'll be using. And then after you spend your 30 minutes, then we'll talk about that. And that'll be how you get your attendance and then we can all go home. Sound good? Also, this is not a finance class, so some professors in strategy, I don't know how many actually here at OSU, will spend a lot of time on this financial evaluation section, and they'll be like, this is how you evaluate your organization's finances. That's not really the purpose of this class. You have classes that do that. So we'll do a brief overview of like some things you need to pay attention to, but being a higher level class, it's all things you all should have seen. So you will spend a ton of time in that. However, when you do a case analysis, it's very common to talk about the financials and to understand what like a cost ratio is, right? Um, return on investments, all these things like that. Uh, but it's very broad concepts, so it's not, not too complicated. So last week we talked about um, a little bit about mission, vision, values, 
uh, I hated, I hate teaching fully virtual. That is like the worst thing for me. If you can't tell, I walk and I use my hands a lot. A lot. Setting in the same spot about ended my life. Uh, I can't. Oh, it kills me. But we talked about uh, these statements answer the big questions: Where are we? Where are we going? And how are we going to get there? But before we start everything, I want to answer one more question, and that is, in your mind, what is the purpose of an organization? To make profit? Always to make profit within the law. Okay. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, would a for-profit organization always be for profit? Would a for-profit organization mission statement always be profit? No. That's their purpose. No, it would probably work when we bring quality products to whoever or whatever. Yeah. Typically, the, you would hope the end would be profit, but not always, for sure. Nobility, my favorite place. Anybody else? At least one more. What's the purpose of an organization? I have a loaded question, honestly. But... I, mean, I think it's to provide a service or a good okay. to whoever is not necessarily consuming it, because it doesn't have to be consuming. something that you yeah. can consume. But... I mean, even nonprofit organizations, it's a service of some type. So it's it's very difficult to answer this question because it kind of depends on the organization, obviously. Um, broadly speaking, so first we're going to zoom out. And the reason we're talking about this, so you know why, is because part of strategy is first, you have to have a clear vision of like what's the purpose of our company and where are we going? Because you can't design a strategy if you don't know what the end goal is, right? I always use like chess analogies. If you don't know that the final object is to capture the king, you can't develop a strategy, otherwise you're just moving pieces around. So Farrell, who is a professor at Auburn University, uh, who writes a lot of textbooks on like ethics and stuff, uh, she stated pretty famously that a organization should move away from profit maximization and they should focus on their benefit to society. So saying that organization's mission statement and purpose should be how can we benefit society with our organization, right? Now that's a more modern view and modern take. It's also typically a take that people have when economics are going very good, because it's the idea that we're all successful, we can afford to do something besides just make money. Milton Friedman, who's a psychologist, famously said that the purpose of an organization is always to maximize profit within the boundaries of the law. And by maximizing profit, they are ultimately acting in the most ethical and socially responsible way. So it's like, let everybody else, let the church give money to people, let these organiza nonprofit organizations help people how they may. But your job as an organization to your employees and to your shareholders is to make as much money as possible and to maximize it. There's no way I can tell you what the right and wrong answer to this is. I can tell you uh, there was a case in 1919 between Ford Motor Company, who I assume everybody knows, Ford Motor Company, right? and the Dodge Brothers, and Ford Motor Company was dominating the market at the time. There was a powerhouse and with the uh, Model T. And Henry Ford said that we are so successful and cars are so prevalent, and I feel like the future, and he was right, is that everybody's going to own a vehicle and it's gonna be essential to life. Like everybody probably drove here today or rode a bus or something, right? And that's gonna be essential to life. Ford is in a unique position. We are in a position we are so dominant and we are the cheapest that we have a responsibility to offer these vehicles at a cheap price so that everybody can own one. So he openly said, and this is key, he openly said, I am going to reduce the cost of the Model T so that more families can afford it, even though it's going to harm the bottom line. They like made that clear. Uh, that became a problem because the Dodge brothers were investors in his company, shareholders, and essentially if the bottom line is hurt, they make less money or potentially lose money, but probably not. And so they sued Henry Ford and said, you can't make an open decision that harms the company and harms us. 
ultimately. Um, you can make decisions as a CEO or an owner that end up harming the company if you thought it was in the best interest. You can't sue over that, right? Like unless they were malicious in it, some sort of evil intent or they broke the law, you can't sue someone to be like, you're a bad CEO, you cost me money, go to jail or you owe me money or whatever. But they sued Henry Ford and a Michigan judge, I believe in 1919 declared that organization's job first and foremost is to maximize profit for shareholders and they have a responsibility to the people that invested in the company to make the money, right? Now that case has been disputed for a very long time. Some people don't use it at all. Some people bring it up in court. Uh, we've definitely shifted as an organization, but taking a huge broad perspective first, what an organization's purpose is, is up to debate. Typically we think for-profit organizations job is to first maximize profit for their employees and shareholders, and then they can move on to whatever steps are next. There's no right or wrong answer to this. Run your company as you want. We live in a capitalistic society. You can do whatever you want with your company. Shareholders don't have to invest in your company, basically. That's a broad perspective of the purpose. So mission, what is the per A mission statement answers that broad question. What's the purpose of our business? So now we're zooming in slightly. Broad perspective, all organizations typically say our perspective, we're trying to make profit. If we're a for-profit organization, zoomed in, each organization can be more specific. So some of them that we put in here, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola's mission, to refresh the world in mind, body, and spirit. Nike's mission, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Starbucks, our mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, one neighbor at a time. Now, what I think is fun about this is when I started my schooling for our, my uh, higher education like 12 years ago, most organizations had these massive like two-page mission statements, and they were much more tangible. Now, I'm not trying to make a statement here. I'm just pointing out like a trend. Now we go to these very fun, catchy, quick mission statements that don't really mean anything. Like our mission is to inspire, nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, one neighbor at a time. First of all, you have to argue that human spirit is something tangible, which is difficult. But uh, yeah, Starbucks. But that is the purpose of a mission statement, essentially. So that is our purpose. Now, the vision of a business, what we want to become, aspiration, Google, to provide access to the world's information in one click. Basically there, at this point, it's ridiculous. My son has an Echo Dot, which of course is connected to another multi-billion dollar corporation called Google. He can ask it anything. That's dangerous. Like, I wonder how many parents are going to completely circumcede the birds and bees conversation because one kid says, Echo, insert question here. Because um, it will answer straight up. He bought something off it the other day and I learned how to turn those settings off real quick. <laughs> like $14.99, I was like, damn. Kraft Heinz Foods to be the best food company growing in a better, a better world. Procter & Gamble, B, and be recognized as the best consumer products and services company in the world. Now we go to the values. I'm gonna talk a little bit about fit really quickly and just because I think it's important when you're trying to design a strategy. So I talk a lot in my HR class and stuff about how your most valuable resource is your employees. And human capital is definitely very, very important when it comes to developing a strategy. Because if you develop a brilliant strategy and you don't have the people to execute it, you fail, right? And a lot of that starts with a value or with the values. So your company should have core values. Now what's very important, oh, this is a bad job there. What's very important is that your organization has values that people actually follow. If you take the top organizations in the world and you go around and you survey people, like, do you think this company actually believes this, this, and this? The overwhelming answer is typically no, like they don't actually follow these rules, they don't actually care about this, and that's not good. Um, you should have a set of values. You should hire employees that match those values. 
so that you can progress forward with your strategy. Now, you run into an issue where if you hire people that disagree with your values, you get what's called cognitive dissonances or poor fit, and then everything goes to hell. But an organization should have core values, what matters to them. Uh, the problem with this is a lot of times they're very broad. We're going to be honest. We're going to hire the best people. What does that mean? Who are the best people? You can't have all the best people. Now we're going to play a fun game, I think. So this is a real, as of two days ago, this is a mission, vision, and value statement. They're not in your slides. They're on a written game. So read this mission, vision, and value statement and tell me what company this is. Some of these are shortened to be fair, to you all at least, so that they fit easier. I noticed that the visions and the values look, the definition seems to look, be both the exact Yeah, they, they posted them twice. Is this going to be random, but like McGraw? Like who does different clips and the... Ah, okay, McGraw Hill. Yeah, I don't know. It's so funny because I used that example in a different class, but no, it's not McGraw Hill. <laughs> That's really cruel that you taught that. I don't think they, they don't even do this textbook. They do my other class's <laughs> textbook. That's why I use them. Is it Lenovo? Who? Lenovo? No, it's not Lenovo. Apple. Yeah. Ah! Apple. There you go. I almost use the old school logo, the one that's like all colorful. I like that one. Yes, this is Apple. Oh, what? Oh, <laughs> boo! Oh, yeah, hold on. I've got to at least move it so you guys can read it now. There we go. The next one's Uber. <laughs> it's actually funny because it. Uber and one in a couple are like my favorite. I think they're hilarious. I have to sign in so I can make changes to my uh, PowerPoint. I was at least smart enough not to put this in the notes that I gave you guys, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good, good. You don't need it for the quiz that I'm going to ask you guys later. Also, how was the quiz? I think they're pretty easy, right? Everybody should have done it. Okay. It was due yesterday. <laughs> So far, everybody's very well. I still have to go through and grade all the, the last question. Oh my gosh, push duo is gonna be the end of me. It is really annoying. Like, I get it, sort of. Like, I'm the type of person that I'm going to complain the second someone steals my stuff, but. <laughs> there we go. Manage my devices. While I'm sitting there letting this load, I'll just go ahead and tell you since it's already been spoiled. Uber's mission statement was transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. That is definitely like kind of a United States little uh, like nudge. Ah, reliable as running water. It's not reliable everywhere. Um, vision, we ignite opportunity by setting the world in motion, which is what the hell does that mean? Um, and then values, go get it. Trip obsessed, build with heart, stand for safety, ironically. See the forest for the trees. Great minds don't think alike, which I do like that statement. That's cool. And now, if I make sure we're not going to have other issues here. Oh, no, it, uh, it cut out the transitions. That's the issue. All right, then I'm just going to read these out loud if you guys don't mind. I don't want to ruin the surprise. Mission statement. To save people money, 
so they can live better. So to save fuel money so they can live better. Vision, be the destination for customers to save money no matter how they want to shop. And the values, respect, service, excellence, and integrity. What'd you say? Walmart. Walmart. And then my personal favorite, uh, they have no vision statement, but they have a mission and a value statement. The mission statement is to give everyone a voice and show them the world. And the value statement, freedom of expression, freedom of information, freedom of opportunity, freedom to belong. It's a tough one. No, you too. How did you know that? Who said that? Ah, see, they've come under a little bit of fire for this because obviously people have argued they've become very like taking different things down century, not just with the COVID push, but before that, there was a lot of stuff where they were taking everything down. And now it's it's ironic because if you look at like Facebook, YouTube, all that stuff, they've now all added this idea of like free flowing ideas and freedom of expression um, because they've had so much pushback that they're not that. Uh, so it, it almost becomes like a marketing ploy in a way. But now, what I will ask in general, as I flip the slides back on here, so listening to all of those, do you believe that they match the organization that stated them? Do they have? Do they matter? Like maybe, like you could say yes. Or a better question, do they actually drive that organization? Kind of this, yeah. Wait. I'm kind of trying to get to an archetype, but they're not perfect. I think it's better for the stakeholders. Okay, how so? Because you've got to be driven, you've got to um, plan your strategic based on your you know, values and vision mm -hmm. so, and make sure that you stay, stick to it. or um, you know, adjust to it, you know, for mm -hmm. Do you think these companies that, like, let's say the four that I just put up here, do you think that they are following those? I might say Walmart is. Walmart is? Okay. Yeah, I think Walmart is actually fairly consistent. Anybody else? Any take? So the reason I'm asking, gonna help you out here, is because there, there's kind of an idea now that, like, missions, values, vision statements, a lot of people see them as, like, uh, all for show like some people think they're just for show and to get like make people feel good you know for attention or you know they're just trying to say the right things um and they have this argument like how are they actually right like a lot of people think that you know google's a great place to work and then you have other companies like uh, amazon they're like oh you know i'm sure amazon i should have put amazon's up here I, I guarantee they have something in there about being an employee friendly environment and they're notoriously known for not being and so this is kind of idea of like evil corporate empires is what they believe. Um, and that's a problem because if that's true, like we teach and you will learn forever and it'll probably stay the same forever that the point of your mission statement and vision statement and the values you have is to say, this is what our strategy is. This is where our company's going so that we can put the right procedures in place, get the right people in place to get there. So if your mission, vision, and values don't mean anything, then because Amazon probably doesn't match their mission and vision statement if they haven't think about being friendly employees or whatever, maybe they do. Um, but if they don't and they're still successful, it's like, well, what's the point of all this? Like they have like these behind the scenes mission statements that they're using. Um, but I'm always just curious. I mean, some people say, yeah. Typically what I, I kind of hear when we talk about this stuff is like vaguely, like Walmart, mostly what they're trying to be. Yes, like I said, in the last 12 years, uh, the mission statements and stuff have changed a lot. They're very bite-sized now. I feel like it's so you can read them on your phone in one paragraph, you know? Which, that's real. So we establish the very forefront of strategy. We establish our mission statement. We establish our vision statement. We establish what values are important to us. And now we have to actually set goals to do them. Now you guys have heard this dead horse. 
Well, I, I love this quote, but I took this directly from the book because I think it, it summarizes as well. While missions, and vision, while missions and visions provide an overall sense of the organization's directions, goals are narrower aims that should provide clear and tangible guidance to employees. Typically, less are more difficult to find online when you're trying to figure out what's Apple's goals. Now, you all have heard this forever, I'm sure. These are called, hopefully you guys know, smart goals, right? Now, I feel like people like ram smart goals down people's throats, and it's like, they're like, trust me. So I'll show you some research here in a second. Um, but essentially, and the book agrees with this too, the book says you should have smart goals. I go a little bit further and I talk about goal setting theory, but smart goals, they should be very specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Now, this comes from uh, Sam Houston State, Dr. Lemonberg. They did a study on goal setting theory and motivation uh, in 2011. And one of the first things they put in their abstract is research supports for decades now that predictions that most effective are well, the predictions that most effective performance seems to result when goals and are specific and challenging. And this whole study talks about how if your goals are specific, if they're uh, goal or uh, time oriented, they're realistic, they're measurable, all of this, then people tend to be more motivated to actually achieve them and you're significantly more likely to achieve them. Now, goal setting theory actually expands upon SMART goals. So the whole purpose of goal setting theory is what kind of goals can we design to motivate employees, to motivate people to actually get there. So one, they do have to be specific. I hate when you see organizations say stuff, like you see the mission statement all the time, stuff like we are gonna be the number one this. Number one is so impossible to measure, right? Like what is number one? I mean, unless you were just leading in every category, it, it, what is number one? Are you the fastest? Are you selling the most? Are you selling the most quality, right? Because sometimes succeeding in what you wanna do isn't being the, isn't selling the most of something, right? It might be selling the best of something. Or maybe your goal is to be environmentally friendly and be successful, right? It doesn't always have to be profit driven as we talked at the beginning. You have to be very specific. They have to be difficult. Literature numerously says, and organizations are essentially breathing, living things comprised of multiple people. Research suggests that if something is too attainable, too easy, people lose focus, right? Very quickly. I love chess and play a lot of chess because I lose all the time. It's fun. <laughs> it's hard to play. Um, especially as we get older, we need something that's more difficult. And the more difficult it is, you tend to get caught into the sort of loop. Uh, I was actually talking with Gile about this and some of my friends last night when we were playing video games about how I love the video game Dark Souls also, which is like really hard if anybody's ever played Dark Souls. But Dark Souls Cell is a billion dollar game. They make tons of money. And uh, part of Dark Souls' like loop, like even the creators talked about this, is presenting you with a daunting task and your goal is kill God, basically. And Presenting the daunting task, but then as you do it, you're like, oh, I can't do it now, but it feels attainable. And there's this like loop of I'm going to keep working and then attaining and then on to the next one. And they create this like, this is very difficult, but very possible. They make a lot of money doing it. So specific, be difficult, but attainable, be accepted by the organization, meaning if the organization agrees is what our goal should be. And that, that's very important. Um, you don't want employees that believe, okay, the organization has set this goal and we can do it, but it's not where we should be going, right? Maybe it's unethical. Maybe it's not what, you know, it doesn't agree with our values at the beginning, or maybe we just all unanimously agree. It's probably not going to work. Even if we get it, like, even if we achieve this goal, maybe it's not the best choice. It needs to be generally accepted. Must have feedback provided on goal attainment. You cannot be like, we achieved this goal. Great, we're successful. We'll do exactly what you did again. 
best way to continue to be successful, to continue to be motivated, is to get feedback after the goal attainment and use this to evaluate performance. So it's like, if you give an employee a goal, I need you to sell X amount this month. If all of us sell X amount a month, this company will achieve this, yay. You receive it and next month you just continue on, nothing happens, right? It should be used to evaluate the performance. So they go, okay, this is right, positive feedback loop, continue. Have deadlines, that goes back to the time. Humans are natural procrastinators. That is proven. Humans are natural procrastinators. It is odd to be proactive. So if you are, good on you. I was struggling getting my dissertation written and my advisor was like, every Monday you have to submit something new to me in writing. Like it has to be a new portion of my dissertation. And it was so funny because for some reason, after spinning my wheels for like two months, now every Monday I produce like five pages. I'm like, yeah. And then she cuts four of them and sends it back. Can I do it again? And then the last two are interesting because these are actually quite separate from SMART goals, but they do matter. They're typically need to be learning goal oriented, motivates employees the most, and it can be most successful for organizations. And what that means is that whatever goal you set, even if learning is secondary, the purpose of the goal is to learn or develop in some way, right? So like employees, it's essentially like training. A lot of that is because if employees, especially if you have goals for them that are only beneficial to the organization, which may ultimately be beneficial to them in the fact that they're job secure, they're only gonna be so motivated, but if part of their goals in some way improves them as an individual, they learn a new skill, then yeah, that's good because they feel personal development, personal connection. And then group goal setting as well as individual is just as important. So we typically think about individual goal setting, but group goal setting as in setting goals for like an entire division, that's pretty common now. It makes everybody accountable for everybody, yeah. So goal setting theory essentially kind of expands upon SMART goals. But I just want you to know that SMART goals are constantly talked about. I don't feel like enough professors talk about the research that went behind them, but we have tons of research that suggests that yes, that is the best way to motivate people. That is the best way to establish goals. Those are the goals that are most likely to be um, performed and actually accomplished. A good way to get goals accepted, I didn't say this, a great way to get goals accepted, which is, is always difficult to get employees on board. Um, Cause I've said in this class before, it's better to have the second best strategy that everybody agrees with than the first best strategy that only half the people actually do, right? Like run the wrong football play, but everybody does it, then yay. Uh, run the right football play, but only half the team does it, then you're probably gonna fail. To get people accepted, it's, it's often important to make sure that everybody's a part of the goal setting, right? Uh, I feel like Tesla seems to be pretty successful and Elon seems to be kind of heading that ship all of himself and seems to be like, we're going to Mars, we're doing this, we're doing this. And it seems like he's directing it. I guarantee there's actually much more conversation going on and it's more of a front that it's all his plan, right? Um, the reason I say it's probably more of a front is because most people wouldn't be that successful if they don't actually delegate and talk around. Cool? Cool. Oh my gosh, we're already almost at 45 minutes. So I was gonna last for 45 minutes. It's gonna be closer to an hour. Sorry. This is the example the book gives. Um, I actually didn't like it because it's, 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 well, it, I like it enough, but it's actually wrong because I looked it up uh, to double check. But specific Coca Cola is seeking to improve its water efficiency by a specific amount 20%. So very specific on what the goal is. We're gonna improve water efficiency by 20%. Is it measurable? You can legitimately measure water efficiency. It can be very much calculated. Is it attainable? Uh, this is why strategy and goal setting can be expensive. Um, there is lots of research studies that say that they can actually measure this and that it's attainable. So like, okay, 20% seems reasonable. They had to assumably bring consultants in that could say, you can reasonably get this down. Is it realistic? Um, if their goal was 95% improvement, we'd probably say no, but maybe looking at the past, looking at uh, other organizations, maybe it's very attainable. The time-bound one is interesting because they don't really say anything. 
if you want to know, Coca-Cola actually said they wanted to improve by 25%. Look, said 20%. 25% by 2020. And they set that goal, I think, in 2015. And this could all be part of Coca-Cola's grand strategy to reduce costs, be more environmentally friendly, whatever it is, right? So now that we've set goals, we've got our mission statement, value statement, vision statement, uh, a lot of this chapter, we're talking about actually evaluating organizational performance. And this is so hard because I just kind of talked about, uh, it's difficult to say who's number one, like how do you measure success, right? Is it just keeping the doors open? Is it getting a higher profit every year? And it just kind of depends. Also, it's difficult to measure organizational performance because, I'll ask this question broadly, is an organization's performance always directly reflective of if a strategy was the right choice or not? Does that make sense? So if a company makes a strategy, and they say, we're going to do this, and we evaluate their performance, does that performance always indicate if it was the correct strategy or not? Or the right choice at the time? No. And why is that? Get lucky. Get lucky. You can also get unlucky. Right. Yeah. So the book uses kind of a funny example. I'm not sure if I like it as much, but I'll take it and expand. So we use organizational performance to say, is an organization reaching their vision, mission, and their goals? And we must know how an organization is performing to know if strategic changes need to be made, right, or adjusted in some way. So let's flip a coin. You, sir. If the book, have you read the book? Did you read the chapter? You feel awesome. That's fine. Great. I'm going to talk about it anyway. Fantastic. Good. I'm glad. Because I was actually hoping if you said yes, I was going to choose somebody else. So the book does this example. I'm expanding upon it. Uh, if I made a bet with you that we're going to flip a coin, Right? And you get to choose if you bet or not. You bet $10, I flip a coin, if it lands on heads, I get your $10. If it lands on tails, I give you $50. Do it? No, sure. Sure? Yes. Yeah. Why? You bet $20. So, well, I get $10. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Well, you get, I know what you're saying. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you're trying to say. So, expected value is the idea of, we would say that you, the option is you should do it. Strategically, analytically, you should flip it because of what's called expected value. So expected value would be, um, you have a 50% chance of getting $50, right? And then you take that and you subtract the 50% chance of the $10, right? And ultimately what you end up with is an expected value of $20 in the end. So you have an expected value of $20, which is more than what you're betting. So expected value says, yes, you should do it. However, if that landed on tails and he loses the money, right, or whatever I said, whichever one it was, and he loses the money, was the first choice necessarily wrong? And, and it's funny because the, your performance was poor. You lost. But it actually was probably the right strategic choice. The other way I like to say is, like, if we bet a billion, if, if, it's, if you land on heads, you get a billion dollars, right? And there's a 5% chance that you're going to fail. And if you fail, everything in your bank account's gone. You basically bankrupt. Then most people are like, yeah, hell yeah, flip that coin. Win a billion dollars, right? Do it. <laughs> um, but if you lose, then it's like, oh, was it really the wrong choice? Right? And so that's why organizational performance is difficult because it's like, do we always actually need to change strategy after something? And so uh, think about the big one that happened recently. There are probably companies out there that spent, there's not probably, there are companies that spent millions of dollars developing brilliant strategies and they are on a really positive growth curve and they're taking advantage and they are just kicking ass in 2019. And then COVID hit and those strategies went out the door. Was it really the wrong strategic choice? 
What's even funnier is what if someone prepared for a pandemic and started hoarding money and was actually shrinking and then the pandemic hits and they're like, ah, success. It's like, was that really the right call? Like <laughs> it worked out, but I mean, is the dude that spent his whole life savings building a bunker under his house and then it turns out zombies are real tomorrow. It's like, well, gosh, I guess you were right, but lucky also. So organizational performance is, is difficult and it's for two reasons. It's because one, there's so many factors out of our control and a lot of factors that won't repeat themselves in the future. Um, on Shark Tank, if you watch Shark Tank, there's been a lot of companies that have been really successful that people have been hesitant to invest in because they go, I think this is the COVID surge. I think that your success in the last year and your choices were benefiting from COVID. As in like what you sold was beneficial. Um, some guy was selling some sort of environmentally friendly like hand sanitizer, right? And they were really hesitant to be like, yeah, your company went from nothing to uh, $50,000 a month. And it's just a one man operation. I don't know if this is gonna hold. So like, I'm hesitant to invest, all right? And then also it's difficult because what measures do you pay attention to? So performance measures are actually financial measures that we'll talk about. And then performance benchmarks are typically, uh, typically when you talk about benchmarks, you're doing benchmarks among the industry. So it's like, okay, maybe you grew at 2%. But the average company in your organization grow or in your industry grows at five percent. So maybe you're actually underperforming, right? Uh, when marijuana became legal in Oklahoma in Stillwater, I counted eight dispensaries, put signs up that they're opening up. Stillwater's population is like forty thousand people, right? Um, and I I know that not all of them have their cards, so uh, eight dispensaries popped up. Now all those dispensaries were probably decently successful at the very beginning. And now they're closing rapidly, right? So even if your organization improved and you said, well, hey, we made profit, even though you probably wouldn't as a starting organization, let's say we made profit, the benchmark of the industry is you're underperforming. And so the industry is eventually going to grow big enough, it's going to consume the market, and someone's going to win, or a few companies are going to win, but we can't expect everybody to win. So if everybody's doing well, great, but eventually a few people win. Tech firms all tend to do well. And then one of them becomes Apple and Microsoft, and they buy everything and they absorb everything, right? It's a pretty scary trend right now. And it used to always exist, but uh, and I told you guys Best Buy had an opportunity, not Best Buy, Blockbuster had an opportunity. When Blockbuster was making right around three to four billion a year, they had an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million, right? And they didn't. And now you get companies like Apple and Microsoft, and as soon as you have a good idea, you're bought, you're absorbed, you come work for us. Like, <laughs> I just have water. Gotta wrap this up. So, real brief. With this information, can you tell me which company is doing the best? Company A or Company B? Say no? Thank you. Okay, basic, simple finance question, just double checking. Cost of goods, gross profit. Can you tell me which company is doing the best? The, um, company A. Company A, they have a gross profit of $50,000, 50% of revenues, $100,000, 50% of, uh, of revenues. Are you, or can we not tell yet? Um, Anybody else, if you have any other thing too, or if you don't, please. You can't tell yet because we also have things like wages, rent, utilities, profit. And at the end, we have a profit margin of 10% or 7.5%. On this basic metric, we would say company A, typically. I just dumped so much water on my face. <laughs> I forgot I didn't have the lid on. We're just gonna roll with it. Oh, I'm gonna waterboard myself with this mask. Hold on. Brought it back up.
best part was turning like, I think it was like 25, 26. I just stopped caring what people think. And that's when I started collecting weird stocks. That's the best moment of my life. Sorry, I'm wet now. I don't know if you can tell, but. So now that was just one metric to measure a company's success based on financial performance. Again, I told you, I'm not going to spend a ton of time in this class. It's not a finance class. And even though I was an economics major, I hate finance. And that's not the focus of this class. Uh, so or accounting or anything. So I did put up here, the book covers some of these and then doesn't others. But this is just a quick look at different ratios, the formula to calculate them and their purpose. I put them on two slides. Yay. The book has a few others that I didn't do and then not all of these. But essentially, part of strategy at the end of a quarter, or annually, whatever, your job would be to, can you guys still hear me okay in this mask? It's different, okay. I bought a lot of the same mask, but I knew everybody could hear me in. I've never worn this one. Uh, and I always get nice comments in my teacher emails that are like, he's one of the few professors I can hear. So I'm like, hell yeah, I bought like 10 of those masks. <laughs> so, <laughs> gotta stick to my, you know, my competitive advantage. Um, at the end of the year is evaluating an organization's performance financially using all sorts of different metrics, different ratios, and then comparing them to industry benchmarks and saying, yeah, we are successful or yeah, we are not. Does anybody have like any immediate finance questions I can attempt to answer before I move on? We're not going to be finance heavy in this. In fact, the two case studies I give you to write up on, I purposely went finance light on. I won the OSU case study, my MBA, not because of me, because of a guy named Ben Miles. And Ben Miles was a finance guy and... I'm a storytelling guy, so I started off the presentation by giving this big talk about breweries, and my father's favorite beer and all this stuff for like 10 minutes, right? Fantastic. And then Ben stepped up, did the finances for the case, kicked ass. It was great. He talked about numbers and I talked about beer. It was great. This slide was supposed to be at the end, but I'm going to, yeah, we'll come back to it. So. The problem with numbers and uh, just doing a financial evaluation is it doesn't tell us everything, as I talked about earlier. So this very, very simple, simple exercise here is great. With the information I gave you, it's pretty easy for you all to look down here and say, okay, let's look at profit, let's look at revenue, let's look at our profit margin. Company A did better, semi-objectively. But that's so limited in scope. We'll talk a little bit about competitive advantage, um, which is a little bit different than maybe you've heard of competitive advantage before, but for the points of strategy. So competitive advantage really relies on what we call economic value, not creative, creation. Don't make fun of my typos. A lot of professors share slides. I made this shit myself. So EVC equals customer's willingness to pay minus the cost of production or still uh, cost of product or service production. So EVC equals WTP minus cost. Now customer willingness to pay can be measured to a degree, right? But it encapsulates a lot of things that more basic financial statistics don't. And essentially, if a firm has a competitive advantage over a competitor, it has larger uh, economic value creation than that competitor. So the reason this matters is because a customer's willingness to pay, your economic value creation can vary for a lot of reasons. And it may not just be the cost that it takes you, uh, that it costs you to create the product, right? Um, People may want to buy for your company from a very, or for various reasons. I dated a girl during my undergrad who always had coach purses, right? Loved coach purses. Some of you probably know where this story's coming. They made these coach purses in some factory and wherever, and I know they bought leather from like Italy because it was more expensive and all this stuff, and they put the, the CB or the coach whatever logo on it. And she had this fantastic coach purse. It looked great. It was worth a billion dollars, whatever it is. And so much money. And I started, you know, because I'm nerding out. Uh, I had a friend that bought a coach purse illegally, black market style, through like a side vendor. 
And I started investigating these like different vendors and like doing like little studies on it. I found this cool lab study where they took a coach purse and they took a knockoff coach purse from a particular vendor. Some of them are bad from a particular vendor and essentially showed that the durability of both were the same. In fact, the street vendor was better because of the type of leather they were using. It was actually stronger. You know, it was just more available. Um, the logos were unidentifiable from an expert at range. They did something where they could look like, at the stitching and they could tell, but it was like under a microscope, right? It was like a certain type of stitching. But they essentially proved the purse is identical, I identical in every physical way. And to the naked eye, it is entirely like, like the same, right? Now, there are bad knockoffs. I'm not saying that. They're fantastic knockoffs. And uh, her purse, I actually know the real value. It was like, oh, like $1,000 or $1,100, right? And this one was 85 Okay. And he probably cost him like $5 to make. <laughs> so, um, so he made real money on this thing. Uh, now it's illegal because he used their uh, logo, but it was basically the same. But she told me, quote, I don't care. I want to know it was expensive. And I was like, hmm, we are not going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't know, Jael rocks a badass, huge diamond ring on her finger. And it is 100% Thing. And she is all about that. When we met and we started getting serious, she goes, you better never buy me a real diamond ring. Because she's all about anti, it's like she doesn't care, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not against diamond rings. Like I know a lot of people want diamond rings, they're fantastic, whatever. But she has a big diamond ring. People comment it all the time and it's not actually diamond. It's like mosinite or whatever. And it was like literally 10% the cost. Other questions? Please. The, the EPC there, is that the pretty much net income, I mean, can't you look at net income and come up with that same idea? Because you're, I mean, your customer willingness to pay would be reflected in revenue, right? And then your, your cost of production would be all your production expenses, which leaves you with net income. Yes, I see what you're saying, for sure, right? The idea of EVC and the reason they use it as competitive advantage is because customer willingness to pay can be reflected in uh, net income. However, you perfectly <laughs> I actually planted it and he asked that question on purpose. Yeah. It's because it often better reflects a company's strategic health and firms that choose to reinvest. Because companies often take what you just said, net income and everything, and all the money they're making, right? And they're actually reinvesting back into the company. So you have people that are really excited, really, really willing to buy these products, really appreciative of this company or whatever. And this company is often reinvesting a lot of these profits, all this stuff back in. It doesn't always reflect on the balance sheet. Also look at companies that end up being negative. Startup companies often are very negative in the first few years, but they could have really good strategies in place, right? And EVC is an essentially a way to say that they're doing better, right? Now you're never gonna see EVC on a balance sheet though, right. because in a lot of ways you're right. Yeah. Now you actually do reflect one of my points that I have. And that is, I'm going to teach you what I believe and what everybody else believes. Uh, I'll use a football example. In football, there was a big push for analytics for a long time. Like we should use analytics and you know this play works the most on this and then do that play. And then there's been pushback on that because a lot of times it fails and the argument's been the analytics don't actually always work because they can't account for things like crowd noise, right? And a player's psyche. Now my argument to that and kind of where you're going is you can measure customer willingness to pay more directly is that if you put the right measures in place, you can measure anything. I mean, I measure people's angry, like anger levels. Like I can measure how depressed you are or like how anxious you're feeling. Like I can measure really intangible things. You can measure cloud crowd noise and it's like success and failure rate on someone. You can measure a player's psyche uh, and their likelihood to execute a play by knowing personality traits of that person and looking at past experience of that person. You can actually finance it down to a number. A lot of people don't like that look that you can put everybody in the numbers, but you can't. Right? Well, kind of crazy. Everything. everything though. It's called time off task. What's TOT? Time off task? Yeah. When you guys take uh, Qualtrics surveys, if you guys done Qualtrics surveys for like research and stuff, you should really read the like terms and service they give you because there's a ton of Qualtrics stuff we can turn on and off. And I leave, if I leave it all on, I can get your IP address. I can tell how long you've been on each screen. I can tell the first time you clicked, the last time you can click. I told, I can tell if you go to different websites. 
right? Like if you leave the sit page while you're doing it. Um, uh, I, I was a part of a study. It was not my study. I was helping in a study one time um, where it was a marketing study where they asked you a bunch of different questions, right? And it was just all random. But what they did was on some of the ads and some of the pages, they would put uh, a very attractive female not wearing the most clothes or a very attractive male not wearing the most clothes. And on the other ones, they put a less attractive person, more clothes. And the whole study was a fraud. They were actually tracking your eyes. They could tell where you were looking. Crazy, right? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> they track everything. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. And they could tell exactly where you're looking, how long you looked. And then based on your answers and based on where you were looking, they can now sell products to you better. Oh, this person stares at the woman's breasts longer and then says stuff about this. We should sell them X. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> I still have water physically coming out of my nose. You guys don't understand. I took a drink and it was like in my brain. So yes, I come back to this and I say, I already kind of said it, profit margin may not necessarily tell us who is the best company. So the ballot scorecard, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about oh, right in an hour. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> Gotta know, I'm at home the rest of the week just with, you know, a four-year-old and eight-year-old. So, like, it's my only interaction. <laughs> so the balanced scorecard approach, uh, the book talks about it, like, in, like, one or two paragraphs. It's, it's pretty relevant nowadays. Uh, it was created by Kaplan and Norton over at Harvard. And this encompasses financial and non-financial measures, all right? This is going to be important because you're going to do it here in a bit. Now, the objective is to avoid an entire fixation on financials because they don't always tell the story. Though, again, I could argue that maybe if you measured all the right stuff, it could. Uh, but, like, where money's going? So wet. Um, so it, it focuses generally. Now, I want to be very vague about this first. The balanced scorecard approach is like, it's a, it's a tool that you use for strategy, but it's often like adapted a lot. So this is typical, but it's not uncommon to see this like broken out in different ways or to combine categories or anything. Uh, but this is pretty standard. And I'll give some examples of it. But the first point of the balanced scorecard, we're going to have a financial measure. So we can actually measure things like return on assets, stocks, price, all that kind of stuff. Customer measure, such as number of new or repeat customers, internal business processes, excuse me, such as speed of serving a new customer, time it creates or it takes to create a new product, or time it takes to create or get a new customer. And then different learning and growth measures, such as like how much training are employees getting? Are they actually learning and applying training? Stuff like that. So it tries to break out away from just the financial sheet. I'm going to go through this, hopefully not too quick, because I know I'm almost at time here and I want to stop. This was kind of the original drawing of it I could find that they used. And so it broke. This is like how you would do like a chart of it, kind of like you see smart goals or SWOT analysis. Um, so it have financial, internal versus processes, learning and growth, customer. And you would essentially say, what are our objectives for each of these categories? How are we going to measure them? What's our target? And what are we doing to get there? Are you, who was this? I knew who this was. This is an actual companies. Did I put it in here? No, I didn't. This next one's Smith National Bank. So this is that same chart, but essentially fi filled out. This is the one I like more because I think it's easier to read. Uh, this comes from the Smith National Bank. So they said essentially our strategy, financial strategy, we want to increase margins, increase in dollar, you can measure it through dollar profits. Our target is 30% revenue. And our initiative, we're going to lower interest rates and therefore increase lending, right? Now let's go to one that's not financial. Uh, customers, let's decrease loan interest rates, small percentage, uh, or excuse me, measures, smaller percentages, decrease by 2%, we're going to decrease advertised interest rates. 
right? We're going to attract new customers or whatever. And the point of this is you can look at your organization at the end using this balanced scorecard, and it's not necessarily all honed in on just the financial report. So there's obviously going to be a lot of finances in it. But yay, Harvard, they make great stuff. Now, you don't hear about the balanced scorecard enough, in my opinion. I like it a lot. Uh, Clearpoint Strategy is a consulting group. They make around three or four million dollars uh, a year, which isn't a ton, but they're a small consulting group. But they tend to be very successful. I put their website here. If you go there, they talk all about the real life balanced scorecard. They also show companies that they've worked with that have been successful and how they've applied this approach. And then the next one is an article that was written up about six reasons the balanced scorecard is still relevant today. And they continue on to talk about companies that still use it and how it's still widely used. But because I want to be non-biased, even though I like it, I did pull a study from 2014 uh, from the Journal of Management, I believe. I think it's the Journal of Management out of Scandinavia. That's it. Yeah, it was like a, it was a, it's a smaller subset journal of a very big journal. And from the abstract, they said, this study explains how senior management's use of balanced scorecards combined with the commitment to serve customers may actually decrease line managers and employees' ability to cope with their workload, increase formal control and performance measurement, reduce the commitment to and time for individual and interactive reflective learning among line managers and employees, and reduce organizational learning. It's a lot of words. If you read it, essentially what it says is it's decreasing organizational learning. And in some ways, it was decreasing um, employees' motivation, companies that use this approach. So it's not always foolproof. I think that's all I want to talk about right now. Yes, it is. So what we're going to do, we are going to take a quick little break, five minutes probably. Is that cool? We'll take five minutes. Uh, we'll come back. And what we're going to do is have people get into groups of three or four people, right? Make sure at least one person has a laptop. And there are a couple of files on Canvas. I've never used this case before, so hopefully it works fine. And there's a little reading you can do for AMC. I, I don't do it right now during a break. I'm going to go over this here in a second because I don't want anybody to do it early. You need to take a break. But we'll come back and do that, talk about it, and then go home. So I will see you at like 640, 645.
for, t- for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys get going on this. But we are going to do a very simple analysis of AMC. Now, full disclosure, I've never had a class actually have to do balance scorecard yet, right? And so I give you kind of a brief overview. So I'll talk about what I'm looking for in them. But this is how we'll do our attendance today. And then we'll talk, we're going to go through it. Do not spend a super long time on this. We'll take like 20 minutes and then we'll we'll talk about it afterwards. But what I need you to do is if you get on, uh, in just a second, I'll have you get into groups, three, four people. I don't care how you do it. Four people is probably better. Um, do a brief case, uh, read the case quickly. I think it's only a, a two or three pages long. It'll be, it's kind of a summary of like how AMC starts, where they're at, stuff like that, problems they're facing. And what I need you all to do is read that, do a quick outline of a SWOT analysis for AMC, what are their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities they have, and threats that are facing AMC. And then I put an Excel file, I believe, on there. As long you can use it, or you can just use something basic like this. Um, and give me what I'm looking for is I actually don't expect people to fill this whole thing out because especially target for a company you're not actually doing a case on, pretty much impossible. Um, so what I'm really interested in is I want a SWOT analysis and I want kind of an analysis of, okay, what is AMC's problem, which should be part of your threats and where they need to go. And so I need what should their objectives be in these categories. And if you can put the measures of where they should go. You're welcome to do the initiative as well, but mostly I'm looking for what should their objectives be in these categories moving forward. Because we're doing a very quick analysis. I don't expect you to look at them and be like, they should do this, they gotta make it this way, this is their goal, this is how we're gonna get there. I want you to look at AMC, break down the company, kind of like we did for Starbucks and say, hey, this is what's happening to them, this is what they're good at, right? And then give me quick objectives that they should do in these categories. To the best of your abilities. This is mostly going to be the balance scorecard, I'm not going to go through and like knock you on. Everybody gets attendance for turning this in, so you're good. Uh, when you go to Canvas, there should be an attendance place, right? When we are done here, at least one of you needs to submit whatever you put together and submit it on there and just make sure your people's names are at the top. And then so I can go on there and look at the names and just give you attendance. It doesn't matter if you don't submit something. If your name's on one that was submitted, I'll give you the credit. Cool. Can everybody find what's on Canvas? Is it there? There should be the case. Okay, let me double check here to make sure it's all there. Or everything I want you to have is on there. This isn't that class. The Excel file was uploaded late, so let me make sure it's actually here. Quick AMC case. Oh, I didn't put it on here. You're right. Uh, it's just, I'll put it on there. It's just a little Excel file that's going to have uh, essentially this if you want to fill it out and use that. You could also do your own. I don't care how you do it. As long as it says these things and their objectives, it's fine. But I'll, I'll throw that up there while you guys read the case. So figure out your teams. Take a second to uh, read the case. I know when you said that, I was like, oh, I know it seems like I'm lying to you, but really, like, they're not required. <laughs> I knew there would be enough people with laptops, so it'd be fine. Uh, also, if you have to submit multiple files, like if you want to have an Excel file with just your SWOT or whatever, or with just the balance scorecard, that's fine. And I just uploaded it.
I'll be right back. I actually kind of have, uh, I managed to get away with dumping so much stuff in my jacket. So, and as for drinks, I mainly just do anything that's not fizzy. Basically, what's interesting is another potential reason is like the classes of like stomach food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good I I
Also, feel free to use any other sources you need to. I, I brought that case because it was the shortest AMC case. And I want you to read like a 30 page case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, most cases are 20 to 30 pages. I gave you the shortest case they had. But yeah, feel free to use any other information you need to. Yeah. Yes. I want the SWOT analysis done for sure. On the balanced scorecard, I want you to mostly focus on like each of those four categories. What could their objective be? Because I think in 20 minutes to evaluate how we're going to measure it, actual goals is kind of difficult. Okay. So strategic objectives for finance, customer. Okay. Yeah. Pay attention to the customer, pay attention to internal processes. Um, and I just, oh, and learning and growth. Just blanked out. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
come together for like a quick five, 10 minute discussion real quick. And I'm excited to get on and read everybody's responses here. Uh, do make sure you actually submit it to the attendance spot. Make sure everybody's name's on it, only one of you needs to submit it. And make sure the name you use is the same one on Canvas. It's like, that happens a lot. Like a lot. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of go, I, know I think I have a general idea of where the groups are. Pretty simple, you're not going to be on the spot or anything. Um, I chose AMC because one, we're probably going to talk about them more in the future, but two, it's a short case study and most people have an opinion on what's going to happen in the movie industry because of COVID kind of changing the world for a second. Spider-Man might have saved it. Who knows? I don't know. It was like the first film to gross like X amount of money or whatever since COVID. Um, first time my family went to the movies was when that came out. Uh, since COVID is what I'm saying, except for me, because I hate people and places. You all are great. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so this first group, just real quick, if you had to give me elevator summary, kind of give me a breakdown, one of whoever, of, um, I don't need you to go through your analysis or your SWOT analysis, your balance sheet. Just give me a brief overview. Um, What's going on with AMC? Where are they kind of at as an industry or as a company? Hard person to exist in a lot of uh, a lot of theaters, um, and they're really have a good market share in the three big cities: Chicago, New York, and LA. Okay. Um, they weaknesses. I mean. Reliance on Hollywood. Yeah, don't get too much in the SWAT analysis yet. Yeah. I'm going to ask about SWAT. I was just kind of just an elevator pitch of how they're doing overall. Uh, okay. Okay. They have a lot of room to grow as they're in the company, and Wanda just purchased 50% of the stock, so that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think even before COVID, it's been always sort of on a steadily on a decline. Do you think AMC or the industry? The industry. Maybe both. Well, yeah, AMC would probably we'll fall with them. But... AMC. I would think as far as theaters go, AMC is. Yeah, but yeah, mostly AMC. Better than the rest. Yeah. Better than the other the yeah, competitors. Yeah. yeah they, when I was, I lived in Stillwater when there was Carmike yeah. Theater there, and AMC took over for them. All right, so this group back here, I assume everybody did the SWAT, right? I know at least we got the SWAT done, right? So give me some strengths of AMC. What are their current strengths as of today? Uh, um, I said they have a good brand name. They have a good brand. They have a lot of locations in uh, several areas. Um, they have a good customer loyalty program, and they're already working on upgrades. They are upgrading. Really? Will you please explain? I actually don't know all the upgrades. I read the case, but it was a while back. Uh, I think one of the upgrades was just that they're shifting some of their theater to premium seating. So they have like the recliners, mm -hmm. more leg room, things like that. They've got better digital technology with the screens that don't require the digital, it's all digital. Yeah. Um, they've got a good customer loyalty program, so they're integrating with uh, Okay. The upgrading is important. The AMC and Stillwater got bed bugs a few years ago. Fun fact. Yeah. Well, they claimed it. There was no indication of it, but someone took posted pictures all over social media and Stillwater of their back being covered in bed by, by bikes, and they were like, "It was AMC." So maybe it wasn't, but it doesn't matter. The image is out there. Um, all right, this group back here. Give me some of their weaknesses right now. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our witnesses trying to get people to the theaters, period. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue streaming services may be more of like a threat. What does AMC themselves, like what about their company themselves is weak? Well, we, we did play like high ticket prices and high food yeah. concessions. Um, our buying power is not as strong as it used to be. So, um, it's true. It's definitely a buyer's market. Yeah. yeah. All right. And some opportunities. This may be difficult. Uh, you two gentlemen were at a group, correct? Yeah. Okay. In the whole what? I'm sorry. The meme stuff, like the being relevant on Wall Street Dads and all of that. Oh, oh I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of brought more attention, but it created a new opportunity to become relevant again. Ah, that's actually interesting. All right, and threats they're facing right here. This is a fun one. Yeah. Some threats that we said are online streaming services, yep. like slash Disney. Mm -hmm. Um. Less disposable income, so just like the economy in general, you just have to be careful with that. So the modern day economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Uh, and then, um, you know, one of the things that they said in it was that they, you know, partnered with someone in China um, and all that, and um, China is very controlling, mm -hmm. so they could just squash them. If oh. They wanted to kind of like kick them out of the yeah. country if they really wanted to. Interesting. Okay. So now, I'm not going to put the entire sports card on you, but I'm going to ask the entire group. But first, we'll start with you guys. Can you? Did you need the balance sports card? Were you able to get to that? We really did not. Really okay, that's fine. I, I just yeah, you guys kind of got screwed in the order I went. Um, so anybody that did get to work to the balance sports card in these four groups, give me some objectives. So now we know what's AMC good at, uh, what are they bad at. We know the opportunities they may have from growth control, and you guys have different ones. Um, they have threats that are numerous right now because the music industry is kind of in a weird flux. Uh, I think more so than a lot of other industries. What's interesting about the movie industry is I think most people could see it being completely abolished or they could see it being a niche that lasts forever. As in being able to go to a movie with a massive theater and, you know, all this access to popcorn and food, you know, it's loud and it's, you know, you have a nice seat and all this stuff that may be irreplaceable. Like it's always there kind of like sports stadiums aren't always doing as well as they used to be because it's so easy to stay home and watch it on TV, but you can't always replicate, you know, you can't have your own football stadium. So you can't replicate that feeling of being there. So maybe movie theaters will be there to last. Um, most things I've read, they believe that what's probably going to happen is you're going to see the idea that theaters are everywhere may die out. And maybe we'll go to core ones in big cities that people go to for the experience. And that's people will be able to charge a hell of a lot of money. Um, but for AMCs particularly, what are some objectives in these categories? I'll just open it up that you believe they should set moving forward that they should focus on. So like, what are some strategic objectives they can set? And then moving forward, that will help them continue to hopefully gain growth. Okay. Yeah, how how international is AMC? I should probably know this as a business professor. Are they very local? They're pretty international. They are? They have theaters in India. They have theaters in China. They're the two major markets for like theaters. Yeah, I, I'm actually like super illiterate on this idea of I don't know how popular going to movies is anywhere else but America because we are like Hollywood, you know? I'm so curious. Okay. Anything else? On the customers, um, um, on the article, so they say they're targeting the from medium to high um, customer base. So I think they should expand to lower income as well too. And they're saying they're targeting professional and more outgoing individuals. So that's something they can you know, expand to. That's actually that's a super good point. There was a case study done by a uh, a researcher in my field that I read that I almost gave you guys, but it was like thirty pages, and I want to make you read it before class because um, I don't know how much we get to get to it. Uh, but they actually expanded upon what you just said about targeting these different um, customer base. And they were actually advocating for cutting R-rated movies out and focusing on family because it turns out movies actually make a lot of more money with their family shows than the R-rated shows. 
and the algorithm shows are age restricted. And also you tend to go as an individual or with a couple, whereas when I take my family to the movies, there's four of us. And when you have a R-rated movie in your fill, your um, theater, it takes up an entire spot and it has to be run and you have to pay for the film. So they were actually arguing their uh, next step for AFC was like, we need to focus on a different, we need to get a customer base and focus on it or expand our customer base. And they were like, eliminate R-rated movies. I mean, the movies that kill it now are, I mean, when I was younger, Lord of the Rings and now Marvel movies and they're all PG-13. Yeah. So my kids went and saw Recently, it. Sing 2 on the top. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Encanto or whatever that's now on Disney and played like crazy, but it was in theaters for a while and it did well. All right. Anything else? No, not everybody may be able to get to this. At least one more. And then I'll add one more thing and we can be done. For the internal version of it, just adapt to and replace technology. Okay. Uh, so increasing their internal processes, basically just uh, investing in themselves, basically. Right. Yeah. Sure. And I mean, I assume movie theaters are capital intensive. I don't know. Anything else anyone wants to add? Um, Go ahead. Does customer throughput increase reaching customers? If I continue to bring the same people back, mm -hmm. they already have um, the recent loyalty program, but I think they could expand on it. I'm really glad you said that because I think something that we, and I should have said this more since this is my failure as a professor. I think something we often do in strategy and when we first start analyzing cases is we think, okay, what's hurting this company? Okay, let's fix it. That's not always necessarily the right way. You over there were talking all about how the loyalty program at AMC is very, very important. And your thought was, they have a good loyalty program, let's make it better, let's expand it. Like we need customers with them. Especially now, they have a good loyalty program and people are staying at home and watching movies, right? right? So we need to expand this, we need to lean into our strengths. So yes, because a lot of times people get cases and they go, okay, what's the problem? Okay, let's just fix what's wrong with us, right? Which is this thing that we don't do well, but maybe we should just focus on what we do well because you can't be a jack of all trades. Well, they can also build on their customer experience. We were discussing like, you know, how having different movies have different characters mm -hmm. and build and bring that to the uh, lobby and stuff and be more interactive with the customers. So like a more of an experience outside of before the actual event. That'd be kind of cool. So it's kind of like like character dress up and stuff yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like Comic Cons and stuff like yeah. that. And they can come in and they're um promoting a special movie or yeah. something like that. I think so. like boss boys or something. You don't know like promotional boss boys or something. Yeah, like having like uh, people like our, like being out there. I, mean, I think it was Frozen did a pretty good job of this, but they had like Olaf walking in the movie theaters and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. I'm pretty sure that was Disney pushed, like they were like putting those in theaters. But yeah, yeah. yeah it's probably Disney's decision, not AMC. But it could. I mean, you could AMC could definitely do this. I mean, they essentially buy the rights to this movie. I don't think anybody's going to problem with you promoting it in the lobby. Yeah. They do a little cut up all the time. By the way, it goes away. If you ask it, not they'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> on, on financial, they can look into uh, increasing the profit margin. Um, according to the article, it's assessed um, 50%. Is this how much? I'm sorry? Uh, it says 50%. So um, I can see it decreasing as the inflation is going up, mm -hmm. but the willingness to pay probably not go up either. Yeah. So they can't fully go up. So it would probably go down, and they should try to make more. Yeah, I, I, I think what's been difficult for AMC and companies like them is when COVID hit, people had less money in their pockets. However, people also had a lot of time to spend on entertainment. And the problem that double slapped AMC is people have less money in their pocket and there are and they're an entertainment industry. However, there's like a hell of a lot of alternatives. Like a lot. Like I mean, we can buy brand new video games in my house for the cost to take four of us to the movies and they play that game for 50 hours. Um, yeah, so the profits can yeah, the profit margin is going to be they can also build on the streaming movies. I know if you go to amc.com and everything else, you can stream the movie, you can buy the movie um, and save it in your library for like $30. Really? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the only, to me personally, and I'm surprised nobody said this yet, the one thing that movie theaters have over everything else outside of the experience 
I think if we get even like another thing they have, I guess, besides the experience of being there, is they get movies first. And that's a big one to me. Now, I'll wait, typically, but I would see the new Spider-Man movie, and all my kids and everybody has, and everybody has, and I'm not going to the theaters, and I can't, you know? Um, February 28th. Is that when it comes out? Man, that's fast now. I feel like they come out of theaters and get going. I remember, I think it was Lord of the Rings, Return of the King was in theaters, and then it was like a six-month period before it came out to rent, yeah. Oh, and then they put it back in the theaters when it won all those awards. Yeah, it went out and then back in. Jeez. I know. How long was it when, like, between... E.T. being in a theater until the time that it was a Oh, I don't know. I'm sure you can look it up. It's like a decade at least. Well, in, in Kanto, was crazy because uh, my kids went and saw it, and then we watched it on Disney Plus uh, 10 days later. Yeah, because yeah, they pulled it, and Disney just put it on their streaming service. So you're literally paying for the experience almost at that point. But, uh, but yeah, but I, I think something movies have is, as of right now, but this is dwindling, they have access to movies first. And that's why now, because we've seen so many movies that are in theaters, but you can also stream them. Now, if you watch, if you pay attention, they're pushing much more. This is only in theaters. Now, they've always said, only in theaters, blah, blah, blah. The text is literally bigger. They typically say at the beginning and at the end now, because people are so used to in the last two years, this is probably streamed also. Like, I can watch this at home, too. And they're like, no, we only have this in theaters. Pay attention to the Spider-Man commercials. Only in theaters right now, limited time, got to watch it. So. All right. Well, uh, we have about 20-ish days until you're for outside the, the quizzes. So two things to say. One on the quiz, one on the case study. Uh, the first case study we have that you all are going to do kind of individually is still planned to be the Zoom case. It's due in about 20 days, so it'll be posted this weekend. It should be fully up and you can see it. Um, the great thing is I only teach one section of this class and we're not mirroring any other class. So I'm going to, if I need to be flexible some dates, I can, but it shouldn't. It's definitely the shortest of the cases. So we'll have that posted. You guys will have full access to that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me whatever. The other thing is the quiz. So the quizzes are usually open at like nine o'clock tonight. I have one question I wanted to adjust because I added more balanced scorecard stuff this morning. Uh, after this, I have to get my daughter from gymnastics and I have to go home and put them in the bed and that question will probably not be adjusted till late. So because of that, instead of this all being due on Tuesday, uh, the quiz being due Tuesday, I'll make it due right before class on Wednesday. So you have that extra time because it's going to be up a few hours later than normal. I hope that's fair. I'm sorry if ever, somebody here is like, I have to do it Tuesday or Wednesday after class. If that's the case. Call me or text me or email me or something and complain and I'll fix it. But I'm sorry, I'm a human being. I have stuff I have to do right after this. <laughs> and so I can't get to that question until tonight. Uh, but then the quiz will be up. And uh, everybody did go on the last quiz. I think they're pretty straightforward. So thank you all. Drive safe in case it is snowing, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yes, submitted the attendance assignment. Make sure everybody's name's on it. It should be attendance 126. And I will give everybody credit. Okay, um, well, there's like this info case. Uh, Assignment that's due uh, the 30th or something. I'm not sure which one you're talking about. I'm sorry, say again. What is it called? Uh, I saw there's like the an assignment that's due on the 30th or something. Is it team selection? I think so. The team selection, all you only have to do it if you have somebody you want to work with, right? If there's somebody you do want to work with in the teams, you can submit that on the team selection. If not, um, then I'm just going to assign you to a team, basically. So if you don't have anybody you want to work with in particular, don't worry about it. But yeah. All right. So yeah, it's nothing you have to do. If, if you're talking about the team selection thing, it's not great. It's just to help me. Yeah, the team. All right. Well, cool. see you. Yeah, drive safe, sir. Thank you. Uh, I got this for five Okay, so two things.